Um, one thing about that too that I didn't mention the crews that went in through the basement and the crews on the top, but they took, they went through pure hellish conditions. Um, the crews in the basement, they spidered, uh, they were actually brand new masks, um, the new high temperature mask, Scott masks, um, spider does. Um, their ticks wired out as well, um, just in their attempt trying to get to me. Stay tuned coming up, it's flashback to episode 227, part one of my two-part interview with Perry Hall, a firefighter who shares his story of a horrific near-miss event and the life-changing impact that had on him. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. At Midwest Fire, they know better efficiency results in less waste, and it adds value to every truck they deliver. That's why they have worked hard to implement lean manufacturing processes throughout their factory. Lean manufacturing means a lower cost to build with the savings passed on to you. To learn more, visit MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 336. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by our new online training platform, Gasaway Virtual Training. We now have 33 online programs for your members. Some of these programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. <clears throat> to learn more, visit samatters.com website and click on the Virtual Training tab. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, a flashback to episode 227, part one of my two-part interview with Perry Hall, a firefighter who shared his story of a horrific near-miss event that changed his life forever. Let me introduce you to Perry Hall. Perry Hall grew up in the fire service with his father in North Carolina. He went on to become a career firefighter in a large municipal department with 500 plus employees. With over 20 years in the fire service, both as a volunteer and paid firefighter holding various positions. Throughout his career, Perry obtained a number of certifications a BA degree in fire administration, and is currently very involved as a fire rescue instructor. Perry is married and is a father of two children and four stepchildren. Perry's own cumulative exposure to a number of critical incidents made a huge impact on him personally. Perry encountered one final incident that dramatically changed his life and his career. Through his personal experience, he's begun educating himself and getting involved in mental health first aid, crisis intervention teams, and training on critical incident stress management to learn more about how critical incidents affect emergency responders, education that would help, education that would have helped him earlier in his career. Currently, he is an advocate for first responders and works to educate others about the effects of trauma among first responders and how important mental wellness is for emergency responders. All right, welcome, Perry, to the SA Matters show. I'm super excited to hear your story, and uh, you really have two stories to tell, the event itself and then the aftermath of the event and, and how that has impacted you and how you've learned to manage through um, some of those challenges. And then you now have a story to share with others. So welcome to the SA Matters show. Well, thank you for having me. Um, this has been a, uh, a long time coming and 
I'll tell a little bit about my story and when it when it 2014 to now has taken a long time. Um, and a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in the fire service in North Carolina. Uh, my father was a retired fire chief from um, the state, and I grew up in his shoes, following him. And I was very blessed. I, I was have over 20 years within the fire service, both volunteer and career, um, holding many positions within. Um, I was very lucky at a young age to get hired with uh, Greensboro Fire Department at uh, 19 years old, um, which is a large municipality here in North Carolina. Um, currently has close to 600 uh, members, um, population of about 280,000 and 26 fire stations. Um, I reached the rank of captain with them. Uh, I was a captain on an engine company. We rode about 3,000 calls a year. Um, it was a very busy engine company, um, fully staffed with four personnel of a single company house. Um, since uh, the events and all, I had uh, separated um, with Greensboro, and I am currently with uh, High Point Fire, which is next door to Greensboro. Um, it's a municipality in the state as well, and I am uh, Battalion Chief um, of Emergency Management and Safety here, uh, which really enjoying my roles and uh, and the department, a wonderful department. Um, also, more important than the fire service side, <clears throat> I spoke of my father, but uh, the family. I believe family is of the utmost importance. Um, I am a divorced uh, father of two. Um, I have been divorced one time, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit in my story. Um, we all know that the divorce rate in emergency services is unfortunately very high. Um, I have since remarried, which is uh, a great blessing, and I uh, have four stepchildren. Um, so we have a full house. I have myself uh, and wife and six children um, and two dogs and a cat. Uh, in an 1800 square foot house. So we're all close. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, it's great though. We love it. Um, family is the most important thing to me. Um, and um, so a little bit about coming out of the, um, out of this event. Um, I had one incident that I'll talk about on May 5th, 2014, that really capped it off. It was my breaking point. Um, and I currently am a very strong advocate for first responders, um, work to have education in the trauma, um, following these incidents and the overall, um, personal well-being and mental wellness for them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the North Carolina peer support team, which I am very fortunate and blessed to be a part of. And, um, also with, within the career, I'm also very active in volunteer service. I'm still a volunteer. Um, I've been up to the ranks of assistant chief in the volunteer department, and uh, my heart belongs with them as well. Mm -hmm. Perry, you said that the, you know, the pinnacle event was the one on May 5th, 2014. Mm -hmm. what, yes. were, what were some of the, what were some of the lead up events that you sure. know, maybe added some, some weight onto the, the, the burden that you were carrying? Sure. The, um, you know, at the time, um, and prior to May 5th, um, you know, I had no education in the mental well-being of firefighters or emergency responders as, as a whole. Um, never heard discussion of. The only thing that we, um, as a fire service as a whole, really, is uh, emergency, or the, uh, excuse me, um, the uh, EPA or a EAP um, that is advertised within your organizations. That was the only thing that I had knowledge of. Um, so with the events that led up to this, I didn't, I, I knew they laid heavy on me, but I didn't think much of them. It was just part of the job. You know, we were all brought up, suck it up. Um, you just deal with your emotions and uh, through alcohol, unfortunately, or whatever it may be, um, shooting, the, shooting the crap at the fire station. Um, but a lot of the ones that looking back, um, leading up to that, were dealing with children. Um, one in particular, a, a child CPR that at the time was the same age of my of the of my young daughter at the time, or um, some murder situations that were dealing with children or witnessed by children. Um, so a lot of them just dealt with uh, 
uh, children base for me. Um, um, I think 9-11 also had an a impact, as sure on many of us. Um, I was very, very blessed to be able to go up there and um, for uh, four occasions past nine, after 9-11, uh, immediately following. And um, I think that also not realizing it at the time, but has a major impact on, on myself anyway. Mm -hmm. And you really, along the way, did you sense – did you sense the weight of these incidents accumulating or was it just not something you given any thought to? I, I really hadn't given it any thought. Um, um, the alcohol side of things, which um, we talk, we'll talk a little bit more in detail in, in a little bit. Um, I realized that I was having a problem with alcohol, um, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do about it. Um, and, I didn't tie the two and two together. Um, after my education and treatment and everything I've done afterwards, I realized that. Um, however, prior to my major event on, uh, or my breaking point on May 5th, 2014, um, I had a very close group of, of firefighters, obviously, um, really close friends, and they attempted to do a, a sorts of an intervention with me um, years back to try and get me some help for the alcohol um, reasons. Um, at the time, um, alcoholics like myself, uh, um, drug addicts, um, unfortunately, um, we try to make a lot of excuses, or I speak for myself, I did. Made a lot of excuses not to get help, not to get treatment. Um, and at the time when they did this with me, um, I was a single father, and uh, my children still, and at the time, mean more to me than anything in the world, um, and my wife now, of course. But... Um, I could not separate myself for a month. That would be, they did this intervention that afternoon. I would be in a treatment facility for a minimum of 30 days. I could not see myself leaving my children uh, for 30 days. And that's why I declined, unfortunately. Um, I did eventually get help. Did you get angry at your friends for trying to help you? I did not. No, I did not at all. Um, I, I was very appreciative of it. Uh, it was probably, it was about a dozen of them. Um, they were all, uh, firefighters and they come together and they tricked me to get me there, which was, which was smart on their part. They asked me to come help. One of the individuals asked me to come help them uh, move something, uh, um, at his church. And I went to go help them move and I walked in the room and they were all in there. So, um, it was uh, very touching and, um, you know, I wasn't upset with them at all at the time. Um, but it was a very emotional time and, uh, but, um, you know, the, the friends are out there and they do notice more than you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after your friends tried to help you and you declined it, um, did things get better, worse, or stay the same? I think uh, after that point, they got better. Um, I actually did um, um, become sober twice. Um, and after a period of time, different periods in that, uh, each time I relapsed. Um, so I would try and, um, and handle it on my own each time. Um, and that never works. Uh, and I was told that from the beginning that it wouldn't work, but, um, you know, hard headed, I attempted to do it. And then, so after that point I did stay, um, sober for a while. So they did help me. Mm -hmm. Um, but then for whatever reason, um, whether it's, um, I thought I could handle it, you know, I could handle a couple drinks. Uh, and then of course I couldn't, um, because I couldn't have just two, never could. Um, it continually went on and on and on. Um, and then also, um, things would just get bad or rough. I was going through a divorce at the time as well. And I would just fall back to the alcohol as well as a relapse. Hmm. And, uh, Okay, so let's uh, let's lead into the event of May fifth. Mm -hmm. um, so, kind of give us an idea of what that day was like, what your what your staffing was, what your um, day was leading up to this event, and then and then walk us um, through this event beginning to end. Sure. So, um, 
We were fully staffed. Um, we ride a uh, minimum of, uh, at Greensboro at the time when I was with Greensboro, rode a minimum of four on every piece of apparatus in the city. Um, so single company house that I was at, um, we had four, uh, myself, the, the uh, uh, company officer, and then an engineer and two firefighters. Um, on the day, actually myself and the engineer were the only two that normally worked that shift. Uh, two firefighters on the back were uh, traded off that day um, with two normal firefighters that were assigned with us. Um, <clears throat> so that day um, started like every many other days. It was a nice and uh, sunny day, uh, warm spring morning. We had rode a couple normal calls that day uh, up to lunch and we were having, we had had a late lunch. So we were actually sitting at the kitchen table finishing up lunch um, when the call come in for a uh, reported structure fire in our first in territory. Okay. And uh, what, what the dispatch say is they were, they were sending you out on that. So we, um, the normal protocol for that, for a single, single story uh, or a single family dwelling, excuse me. Um, you had uh, three engines, two ladders, and then a, a battalion chief on the initial alarm. Um, once we got on the truck and I was reading the MCT notes um, and the communicator came back and said, um, reported basement fire, the MCT notes was saying um, pretty heavily on a basement fire. So we had our, in our minds, you know, gearing up for a basement fire. Um, once this was indicated as a working fire, an additional battalion chief in the heavy rescue was added as well. Um, also of a, uh, note for it is this is this was uh engine eight's first in territory um however it was on the far side of the territory so it's going to be very close to the neighboring house um engine and ladder 10 were in that house and they actually did beat us in by just a few seconds which is common on that outskirts over there um and we were live just a few seconds later uh following their arrival okay and on your arrival what what did you see so uh, uh, engine 10 and ladder 10, they arrived right before us. Um, I assume command gave a size up. They had laid a supply line, the engine company did. Um, we had arrived so quickly after them, they hadn't even um, deployed a uh, attack line yet. Um, so when we arrived, um, noticed a uh, moderate smoke was showing from the, uh, the eaves, the attic area. Um, and it did describe, have a describe, describe the house for me. Okay, sure. It was a, a single family, a single story with a full basement, um, common residential wood frame. Um, <clears throat> it had a, uh, the main entry was a, on the division A or the street side. Um, and then you could tell from our vantage point when we pulled up on the AB corner, you could see the full basement. The direction that the other companies was coming from from the opposite side, they could not see the basement from that side. So with this structure, um, a full walk around, uh, as is with all structures, but with this structure, a full walk around was uh, detrimentally important. W was that done? It was done. Um, the structure was was fairly large for a residential single family, um, or single story, excuse me. Um, so. The initial instant commander um, did uh, walk around of the A and the B and look down the C side. So when they looked down the C side, they didn't see the um, basement door, exterior door that led into the basement. Um, so their assumption was they had to go in through the interior first floor to get to the basement. So when you say he looked down the C side, are you saying that he didn't walk all the way around but stood on the like BC corner and kind of glanced right. down. Yeah. Okay. So while eyes were on the 360, the feet were not. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Correct. All right. So, uh, so that caused him to miss that basement door that was on the seaside. Correct. Yes. Okay. He didn't see that basement door. Okay. Um, good. And to my, my assumption, and uh, that's one thing I've learned um, through this experience is um, assuming things get you in trouble. Um, so I assumed the entire time that the um, attack line was going through the exterior basement door, um, daylight door, which in fact 
it ended up not, um, which kind of is what, how a lot of this snowballed out. Um, so I assume the whole time that uh, when we went into our assignment that that's what was being done, which entail what. Okay, let's back up to the uh, observation on arrival because I interrupted you there when you were talking about the smoke condition to talk about the structure itself. So now um, take us through to what the conditions were on arrival. Yeah, so um, uh, a scene and they advised working fire, you know, on their size up, it was a good size up. Um, I seen that we had a moderate smoke coming from the eaves um, in the attic area of this single family house. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, we could see the basement from our side. They could not see it from their side. Um, so when we arrived, um, the uh, first in engine company obviously took fire attack. The latter company, which was right behind them, was taking ventilation, and we were assigned to search. Um, so my game plan with the search was, um, again, thinking that the attack line was going around to Division C to make entry into the basement, um, to go on to the Division One over top of the fire and search for any viable life. Um, and in terms of VES, just not coming in off of a ladder, but going up above the fire. Um, there was a crew forcing the door when we came off the truck. I assume this was the ladder company which later come and find out that was the fire attack crew. Um, but we thought that that was the ladder company doing their going or, you know, their, their walk around and uh, forcing the door. But um, so we came off myself and two firefighters on the back, uh, fully equipped with our hand tools. I had the tick and uh, the engineer for my company as is common protocol stays back in the system first engine company with the supply line. Um, so that's where we had kind of got to this point up to the front door. The door was forced um, We were the only one standing at the door at that time So no fire no hose line in sight again thinking that it was going around to the division C side Okay, so the the entry was being forced by the engine crew did they have a line with them? Not that we'd seen not that I seen um, at the time. Uh, I know they deployed a line, but um, uh, the backup firefighter, um, come to find out, was forcing that door, I guess, while the initial uh, nozzle person was flaking the line out. Okay. But we didn't see the line, yeah. Okay. Contributing to your thought of that was the truck company, probably the sure. lack of the line being present sure. helped you to think that was truck company, people doing forcible entry. Doing forcible work. entry, yeah. Softening yeah. the doors. Yeah. Uh, now, the at the time you were making entry on Division A, um, did you believe the fire to be in the basement? I did. Yeah. I still thought the fire to be in the basement. Um, I always tried to practice as, uh, I, I attempt to be the first one in the door now, uh, as the company officer. Now that's not always possible. You know, I may be doing a walk around in the, uh, when we're fire attack and cause I had a very trusted group. I trusted my folks. Um, I knew their capabilities, even though these folks were trading on the back, I knew their capabilities. They were just from different shifts. Um, but anyway, I try to make entry first. And the reason being is it's not that I don't trust them, but it's my responsibility as a company officer for their safety. So if something should happen or occur, um, once we first make entry, it should happen uh, by my feet and not by theirs, if that makes sense. So prior to making entry, um, I sounded the floor um, and I did a six sided scan with the tick. Um, visibility was about two to three foot off of the ground, um, smoke bank that far. So, with that, I knew um, that there could very easily be viable life on the ground, you know, somebody laying on the floor. Um, so, that's kind of where we were up to this point. It was myself and two firefighters that were going in to do the primary. Okay. And then uh, the engine crew that did the uh, forced entry, are they with you? Uh, no, no, we were the only crew mm. um, making entry. So that was, again, kind of going into my thought that they were on the basement on the uh, seaside making entry. We were the only crew right there at that time. So engine 10 forced entry on the, on the door on the A side, and then they, they went off to do something else? 
I'm not sure what, what okay. I don't know if they were still uh, working with the hose line. Okay. Um, at that time, I was assuming that they were on the seaside making entry. That was my thought the whole time. I, I guess that they were back working with – I'm not really sure what, what was happening with the uh, the hand line. Okay. And then, uh, all right, continue on with uh, with, with uh, the primary search and uh, conditions and the, what was happening. Yeah, so um, – we uh, being three, we couldn't do a split a split uh, search, so um, we made it into the front door, um, a hallway and a uh, dining area type thing. We made a really quick search of that, um, straight back into a kitchen, um, and then to the right was a hallway that went down to the bedrooms and bathrooms and such like that. So once we got those done, um, scanning kind of a directed type search being a smaller area. Um, excuse me. We uh, went down the hallway um, and it hit those bedrooms real quick. We was coming back and that's when we ran into the um, attack crew um, coming in with the hose line, um, fire attack crew. Um, visibility was zero. I mean, you could have seen if you was laying on the ground, but you know, from working, we couldn't see. So we did a face-to-face -face verbal with the company officer um, of that crew, who was the fire attack crew, and they advised that the fire was on Division One, um, not in the basement. So this kind of changed our my mindset of things. Uh, a little bit about the conditions too. Um, we had heavy smoke on Division One, but we didn't have any heat when we were doing our search. Um, so we made a real quick search knocked out of the primary and we had advised command that we had a all clear and uh, that we did have a par um, so when we were coming back out when we ran into that fire attack crew we were actually coming out for a reassignment okay and uh, so they're now in there with an attack line and they told you the fires on division one now um, what made you initially think the fire was in the basement? Did you see it? I did not personally see it, but it was all the indications of the report, um, of, of the reports coming in. They did have a first party caller that advised the fire was in the basement and um, with their uh, initial size up. Okay. So when they said the fire was on division one, um, I'm curious as your mindset, were you thinking – um, a, uh, well, we must have been wrong in thinking it was in the basement, or were you thinking, B, uh, the fire has now just extended from the basement onto Division One, or C, you were thinking something else? <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking uh, at the time when he came in and told me that, it's very respectable uh, uh, company officer and crew. Um, um, you know, I was thinking that the fire was on Division One because, as a matter of fact, when they did that with our visibility, Say so, okay, we've got confirmation that it's on Division One, um, that it is not in the basement. Actually, vertical ventilation was called for because thinking that it was on the first floor to relieve that that layering. Um, obviously, if we had known the fire was still in the basement, the vertical ventilation wouldn't have been called for. Um, but um, it was about this time as well getting close to it um, that we can get into it in just a second. But I came across the door to the basement uh, and a lot of stuff started happening here at one in seconds. Okay. So the door to the basement, I'm assuming, uh, is it on the C side of the structure? Uh, it's actually in the middle of the house. Okay. Um, so we were coming out, we had done the search, we were coming out, um, facing the B side um, down the hallway. We were facing the B side in the middle of the structure. Um, so we had a, when we were coming out, um, there was a bedroom on the C side. There was a bedroom, a bathroom, and then the doorway to the basement and then the kitchen. Okay. And had the primary search on the first floor been then completed at this point? It had, yes. We'd already given all clear. Um, and we're coming out for reassignment, and that's where we ran into the fire attack crew and the door to the basement. Um, was all right here at this point. Now, and, until you opened that door, did you didn't know it was the door to the basement, did you? I did not know. Um, it was a very um, odd door. 
um, in a lot of ways, but it was very easily missed in the primary. It was recessed back out of the door frame. Um, it was a very little doorknob. It wasn't a common doorknob. And I, actually, I just happened to come across that doorknob. Um, when I did, I, was able, I pushed the door. It was inward swinging towards the stairs. Um, the basement stairs so when I did I seen it was the, the stairs um, my mind's thinking um, the only way they had well we have three options two options really they go down these stairs and I'll get to the fire well let me back up just a minute right at this point also um, the ladder truck ventilation come on and said now we now have um, visible fire heavy fire showing from the uh, CD corner of the basement. Okay. But we now know that the fire is in for sure in the basement. Um, they have heavy fire showing. So my mind thinking all in split seconds is we have two choices. Um, we either have to get out of this house right now or their only viable way to get to this fire is down the basement stairs because at this point, no water had been put on the fire yet. Mm -hmm. Now, you're without the knowledge that there is that exterior door on the C side as well, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking at this time that the, there is not a door because right. they came in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Um, so uh, obviously we, the last choice for any type of basement fire is to go down the interior stairs. But as you say, I'm thinking this is our only chance, our only choice, either that or to get out. Um, so the fire attack crew didn't have any hand tools with them. Um, and we preach carrying hand tools on our company, not only for forcible entry, but for forcible exit as well, if something is needed. Um, so I carry a four foot hook. That's what I always carried. So I told them in a face to face, the attack crew um, to manage the door for me. Um, I was going to sound the stairs for them since they didn't have hand tools. Um, to make sure the stairs were safe and I was turning around and coming back out. Um, so I went down and sounded the stair. I went down about three to four steps sounding the stairs to make sure they were okay, the steps. Um, so this was all going on in a very short period of time. Um, I sounded those stairs, no intentions on my crew going to the basement. It was just to sound the stairs for them and to go out for reassignment. Um, I sounded those stairs thinking that they were managing the door again, assuming that, um, the individual I was talking to knew what managed the door meant or what I meant by it. And evidently they didn't. That was one of my assumptions again, um, turned around to come back out and the door was shut. Uh, okay. So the door shut behind you, you're mm -hmm. in the basement stairwell alone alone yes uh absolute zero visibility um the heat in that partial of a second had gone up so much um the heat was uh, unbearable um you could not see anything i couldn't see anything with my tick um it was a l shaped um stairwell to the basement so it went down and took a hard left into the open area so um, I was unable to hear any or see anything at that point anyway. And the uh, ceiling above me was actually still intact. So everything was coming up from the basement, hitting that ceiling and banking right back down on top of me. Okay. So the, the firefighters on the other side of the door still know you're there, right? And the door closed? Yeah. So the door had closed. Um, uh, immediately I could hear the crew on the other side of the door. So obviously in a life, death situation like that, you would call a mayday. Um, and I teach Rick in self-survival um, and have for many years all across the state, very, very passionate about it. But in all this mind processing that was going on, I decided that it was best for me just to get my message out rather than trying to get all of the information out. Plus I had tried to key up my radio and I kept getting bonked for the busy signal continuously. Um, everybody, it's a, it's a great, problem to have but everybody is assigned a radio so um, if everybody's standing in a very close proximity everybody has the radio up or um, it makes a very 
very difficult to communicate sometimes. So um, I just come on the radio and said, uh, NG10, you shut the door on me. I need you to open the door because I knew they were right on the other side of the door. Well, come to find out what had occurred right at this point is due to all of us being so close together, the radio so uh, traffic so crazy. Um, while I was on the stairs, an evacuation was called. I didn't hear that. Um, oh, 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 stop, 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 stop. What does an evacuation called sound like on a radio? So give me, talk me through that. Sure. Just um, with their, uh, with their protocol at the time, they would just call evacuation, um, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. They'd sound the air horn, long blast on the air horn. Um, and everybody would evacuate due to, uh, that was due to conditions. Um, they, about that point, they had heavy fire through the roof as well. All right. And, and you didn't hear that? No, I didn't hear that. Um, with all the radios so close in proximity, um, you get that real squelchy noise. And I, I never, I never heard that. Um, the guys on the other side of the door did hear that. Um, they didn't leave me on purpose by no means. Um, uh, they thought they were leaving with six three off the fire attack line and three off of a search crew. Uh, however, they were only leaving with five. Um, once they got outside and they heard my message also, they realized that I was still inside. You're a crew of three? Yes. They didn't realize that they were now a crew of two? Or it was just too many people in such a small I mean, space, too much mayhem? What? How absolutely. Were, how, how yeah, they it was, yeah, it was too many people in, in a very tight, you know, residential three-foot hallway. Um, five to six people crammed right there. And also the person that was managing the door, I'm sure they assumed, again, the assuming that when the, he let that door close, everybody was together. Because uh, it was zero visibility. You couldn't see. It was all by voice um, that you could see, you know, who you were with. Mm-hmm. All right, so they had called an evacuation, and everybody on the other side of the door left. Everybody left, yes, sir. Um, I called that message, and the, it was very, very uh, great instant commander, very seasoned. Um, he immediately took that message and ran with it as a mayday, even though it wasn't declared a true mayday. At this point, I would have called a mayday. I uh, gave all my lunar information. Um, however, the instant commander already had that. He already knew everything. He knew where I was. He knew all my lunar um, points. And um, so as much trouble as I was having getting on the radio, I didn't feel it was I needed to tie that up even more. Also, I was trying to um, exit, make an exit for myself. That, that door that shut, did it lock? That's what um, – so all this was going on in a second. So my immediate thought, you know, just mind, body – um, was to reach for a doorknob. And I couldn't find a doorknob. Um, you know, thinking there's got to be a doorknob here. Um, I was no, I knew the door swung towards me. Um, still no doorknob, never could find a doorknob, was feeling for it. Um, so my next thought was to breach the wall, breach the, breach one of the side walls. Now I'm standing on the stairwell um, and I have a four foot hook and a three foot stairwell. Um, so that was very difficult. Also, by my room mapping or my orientation, I knew to the left of me was a bathroom and to the right of me was a kitchen. So the feasibility of breaching one of those walls was very, very slim with all that goes along with those rooms. Um, so also at this point when, the, when my message got out, um, the company officer off of the fire tech crew and the two firefighters that were on my engine come back in to try and find me, to locate the door. Um, however, I knew that it was going to be very difficult for them to find that door with, you know, we, we missed it totally on the primary. Um, also, uh, engine five, or excuse me, uh, rescue five and ladder 52 was deployed as Rick teams through the basement to try and get to me on the stairwell from that direction. All right. So you're in the stairwell. You can't find a doorknob. You got a four foot hook and a three foot space. You got a kitchen and bathroom on both sides, making the breach would have probably either put you into running into 
cabinetry, either bathroom or kitchen. So you're thinking that through and uh, not, not seeing that as a viable option. What, what's going through your mind here? Absolutely. And I actually, um, I tried to use the hook and it just, it wasn't feasible. And I actually punched a hole through the wall trying to see. Um, and when I did, I went through that first layer and then the second layer I hit, you know, a refrigerator or whatever on the backside. So knew that this just wasn't feasible. Um, so by this point, um, I came back on the radio a couple more times. I actually uh, said, guys, y'all got to hurry up. I'm, I'm burning up. Um, so all this heat was banking down on me. This whole event only lasted about three and a half minutes. However, it felt like an eternity. Um, so the air in my bottle had, uh, had became heat saturated. Um, every time I took a breath, it was warm, uh, or hot. The, uh, my tick had whited out, um, to where it was not functional anymore. Um, <clears throat> I was feeling like I was getting stung by a thousand bees, especially on my upper body. Uh, it's extremely, extremely hot. So the heat was almost entirely unbearable. And um, I really credit my ability to take a lot of that heat um, by being a live burn instructor for many of years, which I have been heat sunk. I've gotten too hot to where I you know, shouldn't have been to where I'd felt that heat before. Um, you know, I, I so grateful that it was me and not somebody on my crew or, or another firefighter or even more important a young firefighter if it had been somebody young straight out of recruit school or somebody that had never experienced that I could very easily see that as soon as they start breathing hot air they take their regulator out or when they can't get that door open they take their glove off to try and find it any of those would have been detrimental no questions asked would have would have fell out right there um, so the heat was, was so bad. I knew if they didn't get there soon, I was going to have to go to another option. What's the other option? Did you think through another option? So grateful that it was me and not somebody on my crew or, or another firefighter or even more important, a young firefighter. If it had been somebody young straight out of recruit school or somebody that had never experienced that, I could very easily see that as soon as they start breathing hot air, they take their regulator out. Or when they can't get that door open, they take their glove off to try and find it. Any of those would have been detrimental, no questions asked, would have, would have fell out right there. Um, so the heat was, was so bad, I knew if they didn't get there soon, I was going to have to go to another option. What's the other option? Did you think through another option? I did. Um, so I'd, done, I'd already told myself, and this whole time, too, I'm beating on the door with my hook, with all my might. I don't know how, um, you know, a 225-pound man with all that stuff on did not come through that door. Um, and as we went back and looked at things afterwards, it was a solid core door. But still, I don't know how I didn't jar it, <laughs> 225 pounds, 300-plus pounds with everything on. Um, so my other only option in my mind at that time was to go to the basement. If they did not get to me soon, I was going to the basement. I, I go ahead. Uh, uh, where's the doorknob? <laughs> you, uh, you you're reaching for the doorknob, couldn't find it. Now my curiosity is, did it fall off? Sure. Very, that's a, that's a great question. So this was a, there was nothing on my side, uh, the deadbolt. There was a deadbolt cylinder on my side and the three hinges um, were on my side. On the other side, a little bit about that doorknob, or um, it was the old fashioned type where you put your, it's not, it wasn't a true doorknob. It, it was a recessed um, um, like clamp type thing that you pulled out and you put your finger in. You used to see in the older like sliding sliding doors on closets and things that's what it was on the on the hallway side on the my side there was nothing but a deadbolt cylinder so the whole time I'm reaching I, I'm trying to pull on that deadbolt cylinder and I can't get it to do anything so this was a not to code obviously deal uh, but this was an older house um, so the whole time I'm beating uh, and that's how they actually found me. The, 
the crew that came in on Division One. That's how they found me. Um, I was beaten with all my might. I never thought about dealing down and trying to open it from the bottom. You know, a lot of times you have that little opening there. Um, but come to find out that wouldn't have happened anyway. I couldn't have done that. But I could very easily see if somebody did try to do that when they come to come back out and pull their glove off, and you know, without well, our gloves. Um, why couldn't you do that? What was – It wasn't enough space. Oh, in okay. this particular door, yeah. Okay. I never thought about I've been asked that, which is a wonderful question. Never crossed my mind. Another thing that absolutely never crossed my mind, and again, I teach this stuff and have done it over and over and over again, I never thought to activate my pass. Never once thought to activate it. Mm. Um, and that's where I say, you know, you never know how you're going to react to these situations until you're in it. And training and repetition is so, so, so important to where this stuff – passes are wonderful and they're great, but they go off so much on the fire ground and the training ground, they're not first thought like they should be, I guess. Um, they wasn't for me that day. Um, beating is what they found me by. The pass may have helped a little bit quicker. I don't know. Now, were, you, were you beating on that door with the intent to make noise? Yes, that's what I was doing. And still the activation of the past didn't come to your mind. No, it which never. would make which would make noise. Yes, absolutely. Crazy, absolutely. isn't it? It is crazy. <laughs> yeah. The mind process, I just it never never came to me. Right. Right. Okay. And are you are you hollering or trying to holler through your Yes, through your... yes I'm hollering as well. And again, I'd come back on the radio a couple of times and said, Guys, y'all gotta hurry up. Uh, I'm burning up. Um so I'd already made my mind up if they didn't come within the next you know, few seconds, I was going to the basement. Um, I was praying, you know, God, please get me out of here. Um, I'd also gotten to the point where, you know, please uh, take care of my two children. I didn't know if I was going to make it out of there. Um, to take care of my two children. Um, I knew the odds that if I went to the basement weren't very good. Um, who knows what would have happened if I went to the basement, but I had gotten so heat sunk and so hot that I couldn't take it at the top anymore. Hmm. So you're just really seconds away from making the decision to go down into the basement. And yes. What, what happens? Yes, absolutely. Um, I was by no means going to give up. I was going to fight to the end. But um, I, a lot was going through your mind, my mind at that point. You know, I, I didn't know if I was going to make, make it out of there at that point. I wasn't going to give up. But um, so, again, a few seconds, I was going to go to the basement, but I was beating on the door, and um, all of a sudden the door swung open and two hands grabbed hold of me. I could walk out. I could get out. I just couldn't get out of the position that I was in. So the two hands grabbed hold of me. Um, the heat was absolutely unbearable. Again, we had f heavy fire through the roof at this point, so there was high fire all the way through the house, bottom to top. Um, and we started making our way out to the uh, Division A door. It was communicated to the command that um, I was with the um, initial team, and uh, they evacuated everybody, uh, the crews and the, the RIC teams trying to get to me from the basement. Um, one thing about that, too, that I didn't mention the crews that went in through the basement and the crews on the top, but they took, they went through pure hellish conditions. Um, the crews in the basement, they spidered, uh, they were actually brand new masks. Um, the new high temperature mask, Scott mask, um, spider does, um, their ticks wired out as well. Um, just in their attempt trying to get to me. Hmm. All right. So they, they get you out the, uh, out the door on the A side, then what? So when we was heading out of the stairwell, um, we came up where they grabbed hold of me and we went to the right um, and then had to take an immediate left to get back out the stairway to the front door. When we were coming out to the left, it would have been the three on that crew and myself. It was four of us. To the right, you could, there was a big picture window, and it was giving off some light through that picture window. Well, I could see that one of the firefighters was was drifting off a little bit away from us. I was able to uh, reach over and grab him and pull him back over with us, 
And um, sometime later, weeks later, we talked, and he told me that uh, he was lost. He was disoriented. He didn't know where he was at, um, but he was so hot. He said that he he was going to bail out. He said the only thing he could see was that plate glass, big picture window. But rather than taking that wind out, he thought to himself, if I take this out, more than likely this room is going to flash on them guys. So uh, he had enough self-thought of himself not to take that window um, to keep it from flashing. So luckily I was, was able to grab a hold of him, pull him back over there, and um, we all four made it outside. Um, that was the best breath of air I've ever had, cool air, uh, clean air. And, of course, the guys uh, and gals was helping dress me down, get me some water and uh, over to uh, EMS. All right. And are you in pain at this point? I wasn't. I wasn't in any pain. Um, I was um, just uh, so glad to have that uh, that fresh air, that cool air. Um, I got to EMS. My vital signs were abs- absolutely through the roof. Um, extremely extremely elevated which um understandable but it took some time actually it took about three days for them to come back down to normal limits but uh or normal for me but um they made me sit out for a while they evaluated me um i was red but i didn't have any pain or any blisters um and uh you know of course i wanted to get back with my guys i want to get back with the, with the crew um they did uh get the fire um, under control, they did use elevated streams. It was heavy fire through the roof when we got out. Um, I was able to get the fire under control and all. Uh, after my uh, vitals came back in normal limits, I was able to go back with my crew and overhaul and look at what all um, transpired and everything like that. Still no pain to this point or blisters or anything. But that's going to change, right? It does. So when we come back out, we do overhaul and all. We come back out, and uh, when I was dressing down, I was taking my coat off. I noticed that I popped a couple of blisters um, when I was taking my coat off. So um, I had uh, I was extremely red from the waist up, and uh, I had blisters that had formed and forming on my wrists and forearms. Um, so that was reported to um, the instant commander, um, whose call EMS had been released by that point. They came back out evaluated me. Um, of course I had to go somewhere. I declined transport that I would go to our after hours care uh, facility for treatment. Uh, I was taken off the truck. Why'd you decline the care? Well, it wasn't an emergency. Um, it wasn't anything I needed the ER for that I felt, um, just going to after hours care and, uh, or or I shouldn't say I declined the care. I declined the transport. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they reevaluated me again. My my vitals were still high. Um, you know, they said it was obviously nothing like threatening, but needed needed to be seen. So I decided to take myself rather than the ambulance ride. <laughs> in, tripi- in typical firefighter fashion. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We make the we we make the worst patients. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And. Uh, Something else to mention um, on the on the gear and stuff on my gear. Um, I know a lot of folks have been in those fires where it gets so extremely hot and everything turns to that black tarry mess. I don't really know how to, the carbonation or whatever that it goes on within the fire behavior when it gets that hot. And uh, all my stuff was covered in that. My the again the air packs was brand new. The bottle. Uh, that bottle actually ended up having to be uh, retired. Um, it got so thick in there um, in that short period of time. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's kind of where I was up to this point and um, went went and got uh, seen the, the um, urgent care hour after hours. Um, and got care and care instructions, medications, and had second degree burns on um, both wrists and forearms. And um, entire upper torso from waist up was uh, actually first degree burns. Um, and I learned that day, I never knew this, but that red blotching that you get sometimes in these, when you get that hot, is your blood vessels that are bursting, um, which is the step immediately before 
second degree burn or immediately before blisters start forming. So I was within seconds of uh, most likely going to a burn burn unit, spending a lot of time in the burn center, um, if that had it turned into blisters. Um, luckily it did, just on my wrists and forearms. So um, I was out of work for about a week and then returned to light duty from there. Mm -hmm. Did did your department do any kind of a after action review or discussion or lessons learned or a debrief, anything like that? We did. Um, uh, I actually that night I sat down at home and tried to write up. They didn't ask me to do this. I was doing it on my own. Tried to write up a, a I guess, a statement of my myself. And uh, I found I couldn't do it. I was still so worked up. Again, it took about two to three days for to get back to my normal um, that I couldn't. I wasn't mad or anything. I wasn't. Um, I, I was. I, I was scared in the in the time. I was scared to death. Um, but I think um, if you're a firefighter and you're not scared, there's something wrong. This is the dangerous profession. You just need to have a respect for that for that fright. Um, you need to have a respect for those conditions, but, um, I found that I couldn't do it. So I did eventually write about a page, two page summary of everything that day. Um, when I got back to work, um, we did do a, um, after action, um, all the company officers came in, the, um, safety officer, instant commander and everything. And we worked through the entire event. Mm hmm and what were some of the lessons learned or discussions about the event itself that you would find valuable to share? Um, about the event, um, I know in there and afterwards it was discussed, um, you know, the full 360 walk around. Um, and uh, I know it is common that if it's a large structure, you know, sometimes somebody may peer down the backside rather than walking the full thing. Um, but it can make a difference. Um, assuming we talked about the assuming and how I assume things, um, that was, it's my mistake for assuming things. I should confirm it. Um, but I think, um, when you do things for the same way for so long, you just assume that that's the way it, it is. Um, I know there's been talk on, um, you know, me calling a mayday. It was a mayday situation, obviously. Um, I do not regret the way that I handled it then. I was just trying to get out a very urgent message. And by the time I, I felt, by the time I got that mayday out, that had already been long gone because it takes a little while to get your whole lunar out. Um, let's see what, um, with the incident itself, um, the ventilation, we talked about the ventilation and the vertical hole. We never would have called for a vertical vent if we'd have known the fire was in the basement. Um, again, we thought it was on the first floor by reports it was given by fire attack. Um, but maybe taking that extra little bit to make sure to confirm that it's not in the basement. Mm -hmm. And then uh, was there any discussion about the miscommunication of when you asked them to control the door, but the door wasn't controlled? Did they not hear you, not understand you? There was, um, there was discussion about that. Um, there wasn't ever really any clear definition of what occurred there. It is thought that, um, just didn't understand, didn't understand. So to me, I, I just, I, again, assuming that, um, knowing what managed the door, uh, meant, but, um, you know, that's not against anybody. Everybody's got different, uh, uh, impressions or takes on things and managing the door to them didn't mean, um, what it meant to myself and mm -hmm. to my crew. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then do you, did you have a discussion with your crew about, the, I don't know how to say it, how they, why they didn't miss you? <laughs> you know, is how, you know, how did, how did you guys not know that I was still, still down those steps? Was, was there any discussion about, and I'm not looking for any, blame but what was what did they offer as an explanation is that yeah they probably uh, turn and leave and not realize you're not with them yeah sure they uh they were under full thought that i was with them the whole time um there was so much going on and you know that one of the blessings of a of a municipality that is well staffed is you have a lot of people but having a lot of people also can 
um, hurt you in times, meaning um, you can kind of have the, the turtle effect going on where you have so many people's bottles bouncing together off of one another in a, in a small area. So that that's kind of what happened in this situation. You had six people within, you know, a, a six by six spot um, banging together. The radio traffic was horrendous. Um, and they were following the, the company officer um, who said, all right, we've got everybody, let's go out. So they were following that lead. Okay. And uh, you said you had not heard the evacuation. So uh, at what point did you come to know that the evacuation was ordered, which was the reason they left? Uh, I didn't know that until sometime later. Um, I'm not sure if I learned of it that day. I, I imagine I did learn of it that day, but I, the whole time I was in the structure, I did not know that um, they had been ordered out. I, I can't imagine that you weren't thinking to yourself, and you didn't say that you were, but I'm curious, that you weren't thinking, how could you all leave me? How could you leave me here? Yeah. Were you thinking that? Um, I don't know that it ever really crossed my mind. Um, I was just so fixed on the situation then at, at, at hand um, that, that I never really thought about it. And then I knew the folks that were with me, I knew that they would never have left me purposely. Um, right. that, that it was just a miss, um, just a, a whole lot going on, a whole lot of um, <clears throat> bad things aligned at one time uh -huh. to cause a bad event. So luckily it came out good and positive, but it very close, you know, it'd been a lot worse. Okay. And then I, I guess, uh, you know, you shared some lessons learned and I, you didn't specifically say this as a lesson learned, but I think, um, I think you probably put it among it is the, uh, the need to activate that pass device. Correct? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The need for, um, uh, activating that pass, um, how important Mayday and Rick training is, which, um, you know, Greensboro um, and, and High Point, where I'm at now, they, they take it very, very seriously to train on it tremendously, um, which is wonderful. And uh, But to folks that maybe not use the um, Mayday and Rick training self-survival as much as they should, um, that's it's what saved my life that day. Um, and self-discipline in a way self-discipline not to take that regulator out or to pull those gloves off because um, it would have been so easy for somebody to you know, flip out. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it was a very bad situation. And for somebody without the experience, um, it could have been very detrimental to them. Sure. Experience and training. So um, you go, you get, the, you get some treatment. And uh, you're back to work a week later. They do a they do a debrief, talk about lessons learned, and you're back on the job. So where does it go from here? Thank you again to my guest, Greensboro Firefighter Perry Hall. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you or someone you care about works in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, then we're here to help to improve their safety and survival and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all. And that is to go home to the ones who love them. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had some amazing opportunities to present programs in the virtual platform to groups ranging from size of six to about 400. Thank you to the organizations that have allowed me to offer virtual training to their employees. If you're interested in hosting a virtual program or a live program when the pandemic's over, just click the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There, we're sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. 
Well, that's it. Episode 336 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Greensboro Firefighter Perry Hall. Thank you to our amazing platinum sponsor for six years now, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Gasway Virtual Training. And thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.